Hey guys, my name is Nathan Chan. I'm the CEO and publisher of Founder Magazine. And today we're gonna to be interviewing Greta Rose Van Riel. Uh, she has started four successful multi-million dollar e-commerce brands, uh, Skinny Me Tea, Drop Bottle, Fifth Watches, Skin Tox, and basically she's gonna be sharing with you guys her process, her framework, her formula on how she's been able to build these e-commerce businesses and brands from scratch and be able to scale them at a really, really fast pace. Uh, she's one of the smartest people I know when it comes to this kind of stuff around starting an e-commerce brand and business. And uh, she's also our instructor. She teaches a course called Start and Scale, your online store. And it's a course uh, that we published uh, through Founder and we work with her to come up with this insanely powerful course um, if you want to know more. So Greta, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thanks for having me, Nate. Yeah, I know. Uh, we've spoken a couple of times now, so it's kind of like a walk <laughs> in the park, eh? It is. Yeah. All right. So I guess probably the first question I wanted to ask is, um, how'd you get your job? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I started my first startup, Skinny Me Tea, uh, in 2012, yep. uh, which is six years ago now. Yeah. Uh, I was 22. I was working full time uh, in my first ever job out of uni. Uh, I just finished my degree like late the year before and had started working full time as a digital marketing professional in the city, in Melbourne. Uh, and I guess like straight away, as soon as I started working there, I knew pretty quickly that working for someone else wasn't necessarily for me. I didn't know ne whether there was going to be an alternative to that, but I just knew it wasn't really what I was loving and enjoying. I found it, yeah, a bit um, uh, bureaucratic, I guess. Like yeah. your job is kind of to make your seniors look good, not yeah. to really do your work. Yeah. So I found the whole like politics and structure a bit weird of it. Uh, but yeah, so I guess I started Skinny Me Tea as a side project yep. uh, just because I had been uh, always interested in tea and I'd done a few detoxes on the market and one of my main problems with them was just that they weren't natural enough. Like you're taking a tablet or, you know, you're drinking this powdered mix and you're like what is in here whereas tea is such a, a natural way and if you're detoxing you want a natural product so I was just mixing up my own kind of blends of tea and some of my friends started asking about them and being like oh can I try your like tea thing and I was like yeah I call it a tea tox like a detox with tea and they're like that's so cool I want to try it and then they'd try it and they'd tell their friends about it and then they'd want to try it and then people at my work were wanting to try it and it was just getting, A, really expensive to keep just having to give people tea because I wasn't charging for it yet. And I was like, this is actually expensive to make. Like, these are like high quality ingredients. So, uh, and B, it was getting difficult just corresponding back and forth with everyone like via all different platforms. So I just thought like, it'd be so much easier if I could just sell this online and uh, not have to kind of be the middleman behind, between everyone. So I basically got on and I Googled how to start an online store. Uh, and luckily the first thing that came up was Shopify. And so I opened up Shopify, signed up. Uh, there was a free trial at the time. Uh, and I just got started creating my online store. And so I think within, I think it took me about eight hours to make our initial website. So yeah, wow. it was a quick, easy process. Uh, we only had one product, so it kept it quite streamlined and hit live on the store. And I'd created an Instagram account to kind of go with it because yep. I had just got on Instagram myself and was just really liking the platform and it was fun. And I was like, yeah, I'll just start an extra account. Uh, and when we hit live on the store in our first night, we made four sales in our first night. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like some weekend spending money, that's yeah. handy. Like, but they were to people I didn't know. So yeah. then I was like, hang on, where did these people find out about my store from? Like, I was confused. I was like, I figured it was just like, a few of my friends that I'd messaged saying like, yeah, the store's live, go check it out. 
it was, yeah, completely random people, which was such a cool experience because I was like, who are these people? Um, and it, they'd come from Instagram and they'd seen our product on Instagram. So I started focusing basically all my time and efforts on our Instagram account, growing through there. And so we refer to ourselves as like an Instagram first company. Like we were basically born on Instagram and started our lives out on Instagram, solely marketing through Instagram, no other marketing methods, only Instagram and influencers. Uh, and just using those strategies back in 2012, we were able to scale the store from zero to $600,000 a month in revenue within six months. So it was just some crazy explosive growth. And of course there were all the growing pains to go with that. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And I guess um, before we get into more kind of how others you think, like if you, you know, how others right now like should go about starting their store, creating a brand or selling an e-commerce product, um, can you tell us like what happened next? Because uh, I know that you've, you've started many other businesses. I think yeah, people would love to hear about those as well. So you haven't just done this one time, you've done it multiple times. Yeah, so the next company that I started is called The Fifth Watches. Yep. Uh, and I started that with a co-founder. Uh, we launched in 2014, uh, December 2014. And uh, we grew up our pre-list and pre-demand in a similar kind of way using Instagram and influencers. But we had around an 8,000 person wait list when we launched the store. And in our first day of sales at the fifth, we were able to achieve over $100,000 in sales. Wow. So, and that was in that day alone, basically. So we're like, okay, wow, this is clearly something that we need to be really focusing on. Yes. Um, and so we kept growing that store, growing that store, focusing on the same things, just focusing on the things that worked for us and the channels that worked for us. Uh, which was still mainly Instagram. Uh, and on our first birthday, we did over a million dollars of sales in a single day. Yeah, wow. And that, that is also because that store has a limited sales uh, model, which a time limited sales model. Yep. Sales themselves weren't that limited. Yeah. Um, so basically what we do is we were called the fifth and we only sold on the fifth of each month for five days. And so we're exclusive by time rather than by price, which in you know, a lot of fashion items are exclusive because you know, they've got an expensive price tag. We were able to be exclusive by the fact that there was real scarcity involved because our watches would sell out every month and there was only five days to get them. And if you didn't sign up during the month uh, to be notified uh, of sales, then you'd probably miss out. So that was the fifth. Uh, which was startup number two. And then I started two more e-commerce stores, uh, Drop Bottle and Skin Tox. Drop Bottle was an interesting one because it was actually, and this is a method that I'm sure we'll chat about later as well in more detail, but I am very much uh, for growing a market or growing an audience before you launch a product. Yeah. Um, so launching that product to an engaged audience. And so with Drop Bottle, it was more of a case of, we had a really large audience uh, that we'd already built on Instagram through one of like my vertical and niche accounts uh, called Detox Water. Yep. And it was basically just people putting fruit in their water to infuse the water um, and showing all different combinations and recipes. And it's just like a visually appealing subject. So it did really well on Instagram. I'd seen that it was really trending on Pinterest actually. Yep. And then I brought that trend sort of across onto Instagram because not that many people were posting on it and curated all the content from Pinterest and then increasingly from Instagram for that account. And we were able to grow to like 900,000 followers within a few months, basically. Yeah, wow. So we're like, wow, this like is a really like high momentum topic. Like this is definitely something that is trending in the market right now. How, you know, from a brand perspective, what's a way that we could kind of capitalize on this? Or what's a way that we could, um, commercialize or um, monetize this audience. So 
that it, it, it's detox water. Mm. Uh, so we made a detox water drink bottle, yeah. which made sense. Uh, so like a fashionable and functional drink bottle uh, with a fruit infuser. So then the people that were already quite interested in this topic, of course, were able to kind of buy into the community in another way. So that was an interesting one because we launched the market before we launched the product. And that was chosen in, I think it was 2016 by Oprah as oh, one wow. of her favorite things, which was really cool because we were front page of Amazon for a week as well. And wow. we'd never done much on Amazon before. So that was like how to do Amazon 101 by being thrown in the deep end, mm. um, which was, a lot of fun but and she found us or her team found us through social media so yeah. they were just following us on instagram and so they discovered us through there and it's not like we sent in like our product to like be reviewed or anything it was just it was a big surprise when we got an email from oprah's team being like she's chosen you as one of her favorite things i was like i didn't know oprah knew what we were <laughs> uh, that's so cool that's so cool so it's clear to say like you've had a lot of success you're very, very good at what you do. You've done this multiple times. You've had you know, these incredible brands that you've built. So I guess the first thing that people want to know is like, what's the first place to get started? So obviously, you know, we, we got you to teach a course for us, which is incredible. We've had so many successful students. It's called Start and Scale. But like for people that are just watching this right now, like how can they first get started? What's the first step? The first step's coming up with your idea. Yeah. I'd say. Um... And like, how, how do you, how should people be going about that? So the first thing to note is that you don't need to create some crazy new concept or idea. You can take an existing product that already exists and kind of reinvent that product or change it to make it uh, better or different. So the way that I go about that usually is by changing just a single dimension of the product. So. With the fifth, for example, that dimension was time. So we were able to change our entire direction of the company by just changing that one dimension that was time. Uh, so we were only selling on the fifth of each month for five days and that made our company different. That became one of our like central unique value propositions. So things like time limited, like time limited sales uh, and introducing scarcity and factors like that into the product. Uh, one of the main things that you'll probably usually want to go about changing would be the function of a product. So with Drop Bottle, for example, we took just the average like glass drinking bottle mm -hmm. and we added that extra function, which was the fruit infuser. Mm. So that was like a good way to go about that. So there's time, there's function, then there's design. With Drop Bottle, we added uh, cool like quite fashionable rose gold lids and other like trending kind of colorways and we added like a an easy handle so that it's a glass bottle so that mm. it's transportable as well so yeah. we changed the design or like through that and the last way that i go about generally changing a product would be price so whether there's kind of three different ways that you can go with price you can go for like lower than the average price. You can go for like industry standard pricing, uh, which is in the middle, or you can go for like higher pricing, which might signal more exclusivity, like designer items. So you could create like a limited edition product that is more exclusive in that it's more expensive and it might be a limited run of that as well. So they're kind of the four main things. Uh, function, design, time, and price. Gotcha. So once you've kind of got a few ideas, like how many ideas do you get every day? How do you know which ones are still the ones? For me now, because it's not like you can just have an unlimited amount of <laughs> yeah. uh, stores and ideas, uh, it's the things that I can't not pursue that have been maybe in the back of my mind for a while and I've been kind of like trying to sort through it and then you might have that kind of light bulb moment where you're like yes like finally I've pinpointed exactly what I was trying to like sift through in my mind and when you have that light bulb moment if it is something that you just cannot not do mm. then go for it like yeah all of my products have just been something that's like, this is too good an opportunity or this is too good an idea. I can't like not pursue this. 
So if you just if you if you just keep coming back to it again and again, that's something to definitely pursue. And even just the idea of starting an e-commerce store or being interested in that in general, if you just keep coming back to that idea in your mind, if you see that for yourself in the future and you you like think about that and put a lot of your energy into that, it clearly is something that you should be thinking about pursuing later. So, I mean, at least, you know, resources like this, like our course that we've created, really enable you to be able to do that because it gives you a foundation and guide to get started. I wish that I had this guide <laughs> when I first started. Would have saved me a lot of mistakes. Mm. So like, there's a story that you talked about once before, um, like, how can we like is it a million dollar mistake or something with the tea stock this is a good one can you share oh, that one yeah well it's a good one now yeah, as yeah. a story <laughs> yeah. it was not a good thing to happen at the time yeah, yeah so. uh probably one of the worst days of my life um but yeah so basically we were growing skinny me tea and we were manufacturing in australia still and you know you hear all this like china like it's cheaper it's easier it's better like mm go try it. So we're like, yeah, let's go try the China thing. And we're like, tea, China, like clearly it's a fit. Yeah. Um, so we went over the chi to China and we met with a manufacturer. We'd even met with the guy. Uh, we did a couple of sample order runs. So I wasn't like entirely stupid. I didn't just like be <laughs> like, okay, cool, done. Yep, that's our manufacturer. We got a couple of sample orders, everything was great. We sent it back to Australia to get tested, no problems, all was well. We then, one of my things that I was definitely not as strong in was the manufacturing side at that time. Yes. And I was just like, oh, if I could just not have to deal with the manufacturer again for like a year and just make a really large bulk order of like a year's worth of tea, that would just, make my life that much better yeah because so it's annoying having to order the stock move it somewhere get it all sorted mm -hmm. yep. Yep. and be constantly we just had this problem where we were growing so quickly we were constantly running in and out of stock all the time yep. and i was just like i just don't want to run out anymore i want to be ahead like we'd be excited when we're like three days ahead as yep. opposed to yeah so i wanted to be one year ahead that yep. was my goal that yep. was my dream and we, so I placed a really large order for over a million dollars US of tea. So, and throughout all seemed fine, process was going well. Got the tea and stored it in Hong Kong for a little bit because uh, we were, we still had enough in Australia. We then, after storing it in Hong Kong, we shipped it to Australia. That cost more money again because we had to ship it over and then it got stuck in customs for like three weeks and that cost like another $80,000 or something. So we finally got this tea and we opened up the tea and it was like the exciting day would basically, I think we were about to run out in two days of tea. So it was perfect timing. Yeah. We were about to get it all going out. And we opened up the tea and it was like moldy compost with metal bolts in it. Wow. Like it was like visibly rotting. <laughs> it was absolutely disgusting. I don't think I would touch it like without gloves on. It was like <laughs> waste, nuclear waste. No, not. But it was just horrible. And um, I could visibly see like bits of metal and stuff in it. So wow. I was like, well, clearly there's nothing to be done with this. We even sent it off to the labs just to have a laugh, to see what was in it. And it was yeah. just full of bacteria, E. coli, just oh all God. these different, just lucky we didn't touch it too much anyway so we got it thrown out even throwing it out cost another fourteen thousand dollars that was like a ton of tea yeah, it was like wow. a lot of yeah. tea uh it filled we had like a warehouse space it filled the whole thing like to the roof wow um, just boxes and boxes and boxes and so then we had the problem as well because we hadn't placed another order with any Australian manufacturer. We had to go back to manufacturing the product, like mixing it up ourselves by hand when we were doing like 20,000 orders a month. Yeah, like, wow. So we had to just scale up team really quickly. We had like 30 people alternating different shifts, packing tea, cost so much more money, of course, like someone hand mixing and like blending and then putting oh. a tea, like it into serves in like the packaging is so much more expensive. So that was a huge lesson 
on what not to do with manufacturing. I think I just got a bit ahead of myself and um, now we just order in much like more manageable quantities, not from supplies that we don't know as well. I thought like those couple of sample orders were gonna be a good indication of a larger order, but I haven't placed a really large order yet. So I think just like scaling up and building trust as you go in a more manageable way would be a good tip. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And um, you talked about like, so let's say you've come up with, your, someone's got their idea um, and it just keeps coming back to them like you described. Uh, like, let, let's say you place the order, you get the samples, um, you place the order and you know, it's all looking good. You've got your MOQ, minimum order quantity, you've booked that. Um, and you talked about building an audience first. What did, what did you mean by that? Um, yeah, so I mean, building an audience, I mean on social media, yeah. usually. Yeah. Um, that's where all of my audiences live across social media and I guess our email marketing lists as yeah. well. So, and those go hand in hand as well. You want to simultaneously build an audience on social media and use that audience to get signups for, you know, maybe your pre-launch or your wait list for your product uh, yep. via email so that then once you launch, you can do a big email push out to those. Yep. So social media is definitely, and Instagram specifically is still one of the key places that I will go to when starting any new startup, any new company today still as well. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of people so are like, right. Yeah, I mean, founder has seen how powerful <laughs> yeah. social media is too. Yeah. You have what, 1.4 million followers on yeah, your Instagram account right now? now yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So definitely Instagram has been a place and I've built all different communities on Instagram. So across all of my different Instagram accounts, I have over 16 million followers in reach, which is not just on my branded or personal accounts either. That's across different niches and areas. So around Skinny Me Tea, we built all different pages like detox pages, like health pages, fitness pages, recipe and food pages, just basically like based off our customer personas and who, what we knew about our audience and what their interests and interest groups were, we applied those to those accounts uh, and then we're kind of able to grow these large engaged followings around these topics. So those are a great starting point for launching any new business in those areas now as well, because we already have those audiences like with Drop Bottle that we're able to instantly, not instantly, but <laughs> we're able to monetize with the right product. Yeah, so talk to me like if you were to start a new brand, um, you know, there's this an idea that keeps coming back to you. You want to build that audience uh, over Instagram. Just like, obviously, we could talk about this all day. Even myself, I could share a lot. But what are some things that people can use to get started if you were starting today on building that audience on Instagram? You're not going to get 100,000 followers over a couple of days. You, you've built a, a massive like book or, or of pages where you can that you can get them to shout each other out so you can build up really fast. Mm. But if someone's just starting, just starting cold, out. hard scratch, this is their first business, like what would you do? Like how would you approach Instagram, or YouTube, you, you name it, yeah. Yeah, well, basically for any social channel, there's what I call my like three C's of community. Yep. Uh, and so those are like the three kind of pillars that I always think about when I'm starting any new social uh, account. Yep. And this works across the board as yep. well, not just on Instagram. So those are content, collaboration and consistency. Yep. Uh, so I guess if we just break down yeah. each a little bit, uh, content wise, it's about posting the content, not just that you want to see from your brand and what you think your brand is, but that your audience actually responds to. So it's breaking down and I call it content weighting. So weighting your content more toward the things that your audience really responds to and loves and not avoiding the other things, but just having a larger, like an 80-20 kind of rule. Yep. So 80% like popular engaging content and 20%, you know, things that you feel uh, like product and promotion sort of content. Yep. Uh, so, and I call it, I have 
this other thing that I call um, our content territories. Yep. So I break down the types of content that we post on our account into some different territories. So for the fifth, we had things like rest and relaxation, aspire and inspire, so kind of more motivational content. We had uh, like an explore kind of one, um, which was travel content. So they were all different things that our audience, we knew that our audience was interested in yep. and that we knew because we'd posted similar content before. So it's just like getting, it's testing different types of content until you find that those core kind of areas that your audience really, really engages in uh, yep. with. So that from a content perspective, that is probably like my number one tip, just post audience that your con uh, audience, that <laughs> post content that your audience wants to see. Yep. Um, and so then this takes us on to the collaboration stage. And this is probably the most important stage for growth. So content is like your foundation of your account. You have to have content, of course, yep. uh, that's always going to be there. Collaboration is definitely a step that some people will miss. Uh, and by collaboration, I mean actively working with other pages on Instagram, other brands on Instagram and influencers on Instagram. So by pages, I mean like things like those vertical accounts that I was talking about before, like detox pages, like health pages, if you're in like a similar niche to us or fashion pages. Yeah, um, there's heaps of them. It's like, yeah, we call them fan pages. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so yeah, niche pages, fan pages, vertical accounts, whatever you call them, getting in contact with those. Uh, usually they'll either have their email in their bio or this platform called Kick, yep. um, which a lot of them still use or Telegram. Yep. It just depends, it'll be in their bio or you can reach out to them via DM. And you can either, if you already have a following, you can trade um, shout outs. So it's like just a mutually beneficial relationship. So say you have 5,000 followers and they have 5,000 followers. You both shout each other out, basically post a piece of content and mention the other page uh, in that content and you mutually grow off each other or there's paid shout outs. So if you're just starting out from early days, uh, you could pay for some shout outs to get you that initial traction and attention from some of these pages where you know your target audience already lives. Another thing that I'd recommend is not just paying for uh, shout outs, but paying for engagement as well. So this isn't something that you're going to always need to do down the track, but in the early days of an account, you can get really huge attract and really huge traction if the right people are interacting, if influencers and the right pages from your niche are interacting with your account because it's growing your account within that niche. So niching down on your account is really, really important. So focusing content around like what your niche or interest group is surrounding your product is really important because in, that's the way that the Instagram algorithm works. It attributes uh, like followers and audiences to different niches uh, and it shows content on the explore page, for example, and even the content that comes up in your news feed based off your interests and what you've engaged with in the past. So it's really important to be niche specific at the same time. So that's when you're working with pages. So either for paid shout outs and paid engagement, uh, or paid engagement just means that they're engaging with your posts when you post. So making sure that they're liking that post and commenting on that post um, earlier rather than later. And then another form of collaboration is brand to brand collaboration, which is huge as well. So when you collaborate with like it could just be one other brand or it could be for a loop giveaway with a lot of other brands. Uh, giveaway, yep. Yeah, for giveaways basically. Yep. So you collaborate with another brand, you host a giveaway, you have complementary products. So not competing products. It would be like, okay, Skinny Me Tea makes sense to collaborate with like a health or beauty company. Uh, so maybe like a scrub and then maybe a bikini company as well, because all those things would go hand in hand. The same people would be interested in doing a tea tox that would be interested in buying a bikini and et cetera. So that just makes uh, sense in that way. So collaborating with like-minded companies to leverage off each other's uh, followers and, 
account uh, and giveaways are just a really, really core central way to grow. So the fifth, for example, we did a tag to win giveaway and we got 80,000 tags on wow. the post and grew 20,000 followers overnight. Wow. And we only gave away two watches. So yeah. it was a very low kind of cost and really high return. So then, yeah, so brand to brand collaboration. And then the last way, and the way that I use for all of my brands is influencer collaboration. Yep. So this is collaborating with uh, social media personalities more so, not the fan pages. These are real people that have grown engaged audiences around their interests uh, or around themselves, like if they're a TV personality or something, for example. So people all follow them on Instagram uh, and the core thing about influencers is that they already have their audience's pre-owned trust and they're able to leverage that pre-owned trust on your brand's behalf. So you're able to kind of scale that trust that can take years for brands to build in the past really, really quickly at an mm. unprecedented rate. So it is a huge opportunity for right now because this is something that is working now and it's something that wasn't possible before. Nobody you know yeah. there weren't like girls that lived like literally like the whole girl next door thing yeah. where they have 200,000 instagram followers as well like yeah. these people just didn't exist like five years ago yeah when i first started skinny me team influencer was somebody with a thousand followers wow and that's how we discovered influencer marketing in the first place a girl from tasmania bought our tea we didn't send it out to her or anything she loved the tea she lost some weight doing our tea talks she took a before and after photo posted it to her instagram and we had our biggest day of sales ever and I was like, oh, wow. Like, so every time I see a girl with like over a thousand followers, I'm just going to quickly reach out to her and ask her whether um, I could send her some free tea uh, in return for her posting. And at the time that was like this crazy idea. Like people would be like, what do you mean you want to send me tea to just post it? Like, of course, like, and like 95% of people would just do it in return for the product. Mm. Now it's become an entire market and it's a huge, huge industry within itself. And I have an influencer marketing platform as well called Hey Influencers. Uh, and the fact that I've chosen to focus on that as a product shows just how powerful this was for my e-commerce brands. It's something that has been integral to the success of us growing. So there's all different ways to kind of work and collaborate with influencers. And maybe we'll come back to a few of those later. But yeah. the last C, sorry, sorry. Yeah, please, I, on, I like this, to just this is good. This is good. chat away. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> so we've had content, we've had collaboration, and then there's finally consistency. So consistency, there's two kind of reasons that you want to be consistent. Uh, one is because most social platforms prioritize accounts that post more frequently. Frequency of posting is one of the things that affects the algorithms of most of these platforms. So they want to, of course, show more content to people uh, that are more engaged with their platform, that are posting regularly. So consistency is good in that way. But consistency also creates uh, memorability through repetition. So if someone, if your target audience or your customer is seeing you show up every single day again and again in their newsfeed, it starts to continue, like it starts to build that relationship with them. And so again, you're able to scale that brand equity through consistency. It creates that much wanted front of mind association with your product. It's like when you're thinking of, okay, I need a new car and like three car brands that you like pop up in your head. You want to be that first thing that pops up in someone's head. You want someone to be like entrepreneurship founder. Like it just, it's those words that have that association. So when you do show up every day and you are consistent with your content and with your community, you can start to build that front of mind association, which is just one of the most important things for a brand. So yeah, they're my three C's yeah, of community awesome. content collaboration, consistency. Yeah, it's awesome. And yeah, just on the content piece, like one thing that I've found with a lot of Instagram accounts is the reason that they lose engagement is because they lose that consistency piece. It is so key. Mm. Um, like for Founder, we've posted seven to 10 times a day for like the past three years. Wow, that is a every, huge frequency. Yeah, yeah, every single day. And that's why 
you know, you said to me the other day, like founders accounts, like super engaged, like really, it really It is hugely strong. engaged. Yeah, so. You guys posted me the other day <laughs> and it got like 17, 18,000 likes and I gained a thousand followers on my yeah. personal account from being just mentioned at the very end of the caption. Yeah. I was like, keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about like a little bit more on the influencer marketing piece, because I know that there are a lot of people that perhaps have created, um, let's say they launched their brand and they've sent out products and they don't get a return. And then they just don't believe that it works. It mm. doesn't work anymore or, yeah. you know, this, this influencer marketing stuff's a sinking ship. Yeah. I think first up, the return section. I think that when you're looking to get a return in anything and any form of marketing, you have to know what that return was going to be. You can't just put something out there and expect for something to just come back in. So I think focusing on what the result is that you're looking toward. And the way that I generally go about that is by determining my goals before I set a campaign or before I set a collaboration. I think from the very outset, what do I want this campaign or collaboration to achieve? And those goals I generally break down into four main areas, which are increasing brand awareness, uh, generating content, uh, growing my social following, or generating sales. So they're the four kind of main goals that I look at before starting any influencer marketing campaign. And then you're able to kind of work backward from that goal or reverse engineer that goal, deconstruct that goal to be able to achieve the result that you want. So then once you know what the um, result you're working toward is, you can apply the type of campaign to that. So an example for a brand awareness campaign would be a product for post, sorry, for a brand awareness, an example for a brand awareness goal would be a product for post campaign. So that's basically where you send out a product in return for the influencer posting on that product to their social channel. Not every influencer will do this, of course. This is a micro influencer strategy. So for people with definitely under 50,000 followers, usually under 20,000 followers, closer to that 10 to 15,000 follower mark yep. is the kind of hot spot for, uh, in terms of follower level yep. for a product for post campaign. Uh, and again, it's good to know that not every single influencer is always going to post on your brand. It's about relationship building with those influencers at the same time, making them feel involved in your brand's story, making them understand why you chose them, why you selected them, why you think that your audience will and your customers will really engage with that product. Um, so it's just making the influencer feel kind of special and understanding why it's important to be working with your brand. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like PR in a way. You send out a thousand press releases and maybe you'll only get a few articles written. But, I mean, you're not going to send out a thousand <laughs> products and only get a few posts. Yeah. I, usually the industry standard completion rate is maybe like 50, 60 percent of the influencers that you send out product to with you know the right follow-ups will generally um, post on that product. So that's for the brand awareness goal. For uh, generating content, we just tweak the product for post campaign a little and do a product for content campaign. So rather than expecting the influencer to post it to their social channel, you lower that expectation and you just ask for content or you might ask for a little bit more content. So say your product's worth something like $200, like the fifth. Uh, you might expect you know, between three to five images in return for gifting the watch rather than just one image. And so brands are constantly needing new content, like we spoke about in the content part of my three Cs, yeah. to post to their social feed. And influencer generated content is the best content to post to social media because it's platform native. Like think about when you're scrolling through your Instagram feed and you see like a stock image or an ad, you just keep scrolling. But influencer generated content makes you like stop and look at the photo because it looks like it's meant to be there. Mm. So you get that attention and attention is just becoming increasingly hard to get. Like attention spans are an all time low. The average 
human attention span is like something like six or seven seconds now in 2018 and it was 12 seconds a few years ago. So it's just dropping rapidly. So to be able to get that attention is so important. So influencer generating content and generating content is a really, really strong goal. Uh, then moving on to increasing your social following, like we spoke about in uh, the collaboration section of my three C's, giveaways. So running an influencer hosted giveaway, like you, you probably see on Instagram, influencers posting saying, you know, for example, with the fifth, they'd say, hi guys, I have like two watches to give away. The fifth of like kindly gifted me, um, tag a friend on this post and both follow uh, the fifth on Instagram to go in the draw to win. And because you're giving away two watches as well, they'll both follow the account mm. uh, and you keep growing your social following like that. It's quite a cost effective way to target following, um, growing your social following. So it's good to have a really strong call to action. Uh, and then the last method uh, and goal, so the goal is sales, of course. One of the methods that you can go about for a sales goal uh, in terms of your campaign type in an influencer campaign is a personalized discount code yep. uh, campaign. And they work really well because you're able to directly attribute the sales to that influencer. You can say, okay, you can instantly kind of know whether it was worth it in terms of a monetary return or not, yep. uh, which is always gonna be the best indicator of whether something worked or not financially for a business. Yep. So, and I mean, our brands, like your, your, your girlfriend's brand as yeah, well, Healthish, yep. Healthish yep. Uh, have achieved great results using this attribution kind of method of a personalized discount code. So basically it's like saying, hi, like my uh, discount code is Greta15 and you get 15% off store wide using my code. Yeah. And you probably see them on Insta. Companies like Daniel Wellington really oh, popularized yeah. that method and yep. grew very, very quickly yep. uh, using that method. Uh, so basically it just is a way to be able to know whether or not the influencer did um, generate sales off that. And for example, with the fifth, one of our best posts in terms of like ROI and monetary return was we spent a thousand dollars on a post with one influencer and we got $23,000 in attributed sales from that one influencer over the space of just a week. Wow. Um, and that was with a YouTube video and YouTube is pretty evergreen. So yeah. that post is still generating sales for us today yeah, at wow. the same time. So, and you guys have a similar sort of story with health issues. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so look, we could talk about this stuff all day, <laughs> every day, like you're- And we actually kind of do. Yeah, we do in, inside <laughs> Greta's course, like, but she's more, te she's teaching, it's not about me and I'm not asking her questions. It's actually fully scripted, like, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. But anyways, long story short, um, we have to work towards wrapping up. Yeah. So for anyone that is thinking about starting an e-commerce brand or want to start a business, like maybe three pieces of advice you'd love to give and then we can work towards wrapping up. Yeah, so I think that I'd have to go back again to start building an audience as soon as possible. Yep. Uh, you like don't even need to have your product like completely formed in your mind yet. Like yep. you don't even have to know exactly what you're going to do. You might just know the general area you're interested in. Like you're like, okay, I'm definitely you know, interested in the fitness industry. And so you might start building an account and a community around fitness, uh, giving different workout tips or recipes or nutritional advice, whatever, uh, and start to grow that community there because the best way to know that your product is going to succeed and to uh, have good validation early on is by having an audience to already launch to. So that would be tip number one. My tip number two would be, and it's a quote from yep. Reid Hoffman, yep. if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. When I launched Skinny Me Tea, I literally would hand blend the tea, put it in these little hideous cellophane bags, wrap them up, put like a sticker on it, write with a permanent marker, SMT, or just do a love heart, 
Oh, God, it makes me kind of sick. I didn't know um, about this one. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, onto the like little cellophane thing, and that was how I sealed the bag. And then I'd put it in an envelope, like literally just like a postage envelope that you'd put a letter in because it was very flat. So we got to send it out for like a dollar mm. um, and I'd ship it out. People would get this like random mix of herbs in the mail and be like, yeah, cool, <laughs> got my tea. Yeah. So I think just, yeah, that is just the number one tip. If you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late, you honestly, it's just about taking those little steps and iterating on those steps to scale. So you just, you do things, you keep doing, 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 you make a mistake, you iterate or pivot a bit, you fix that mistake and you keep going. It's just problem solving on your feet again and again. So it's not as scary as it could be. Then number three. Yeah, so, and then tip number three would be build a brand, not a store. Yeah. So there is a huge, huge difference in e-commerce. It's a fundamental difference. And that difference is between building an e-commerce store and building an e-commerce brand. And a store is just something that is there. You have a product on it. You make some sales, you get some money. and Drop it, shipping. It tips, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Drop shipping would be an example of an e-commerce store. A brand, on the other hand, is something that you're building value into. You're building brand equity and you're building up an asset that one day you'll be able to sell. So it's a scalable asset. So one definition that's just easy to understand of what brand is, is a brand is if you took all your products out of your brand, what value would be left over at the end? And that is your brand. It yeah. is it's you know things like front of mind positioning that we spoke about it's scaling brand equity through trust through influencer relationships it's consistency and creating a good product experience around your brand so focusing on building a brand from day one so they're the three awesome all right well this is a great chat greta i Thanks, think um mate. yeah like you know i think people are going to get so much to take away from this interview now, um, if people want to find out more about your course that you've published with us at Founder, it's like a fully in-depth course, takes you step by step through Greta's framework. Uh, people can go to founder.com forward slash e-commerce and there'll be links uh, below this episode slash interview. But um, where can people find out more about your brands and, and everything that you've, you've, like all your bodies of work? I would just follow me on Instagram because I've got all my links in the yep. bio there as well. Yep. Uh, so at Greta, it's a really easy one. Yep. I awesome. took the OG handle there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, look, thanks so much, Greta. It's a great time. Thanks for having me. Awesome. My pleasure. <laughs>